welcome to The Knife Show, where we dissect the human psyche and society. My name is Denzel Mensa. I'm an ENFJ. And my name is Joyce Meng, and I'm an INFJ. And today we're here to talk about the INFJ overhype. Although we say the INFJ overhype, it's actually a lot of types that are not only overhyped, but also underhyped. And we think that that a lot of times can take away from the individuality of a person. So a lot of people feel like, oh, you know, type boxes me in. And, you know, a lot of times that could be in a good way, that could be in a bad way. Um, and although I am a huge proponent of type, and so is Joyce, um, we believe that type is meant to be more of a tool to help you get free from the box, not to box you in. You know, if you're feeling boxed in everywhere that you're, you are in life, you know, like there's categories, of course, with our world today, um, just being candid, um, I guess it's not as easy to say that, you know, we're boxed in with our genders or our sexes, you know, because, you know, there's fluctuation over there as well. But um, you're boxed in, you know, like when it comes to like your ethnicity, for example, or you're like, you're categorized in all of these different ways, but it's not supposed to be something that inhibits you. Um, however, something that I see frequently is the, uh, the notion that if someone is an INFJ, before you even get to know the person, um, you already have this idealized perception of that person. And in the same way, you know, if somebody's an ISFJ, for example, then you already have an opposite kind of view of that person or even an ISTJ of some sort, you know? Um, and I don't really think that that's, that's right um, because you're you're not even allowing the person to to show you who they are as an individual. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about like why that happens and maybe some ways on how we can probably like counter that. That's a great idea, Denzel. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain types in the community. When you hear that someone is that type, you might have a halo effect with that type. So you might go like, "Wow." They're an INFJ, so they must have these great qualities to them. And then you'll project the positive quality in which you find their type to be onto their entire person. And all types are amazing in their own way. All types are equally as, as great. Mm -hmm. um, I see in the tech community, there are certain other types that are demonized sometimes, like ESTJs. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have a horns effect with that type mm -hmm. where they kind of go like, Oh, my ESTJ boss, they're just so commanding. <laughs> so I, I, I hear that a lot. And so oftentimes we have associations with certain types that either make us view a person hyper positively or hyper negatively. Whereas we don't take the time to really get to know a person before having an initial impression, which is a human thing to do, right? Evolutionarily speaking, it was a evolutionary advantage to be able to size someone up in a few seconds so they couldn't make you suffer. <laughs> yeah, but now in today's current age, we don't have those type of safety threats. And so these biological responses we have to judge things quickly, while they might have helped us before, they might be hindering us now. So the things that help us initially may be a hindrance now. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. Sure. And I, I think that it, it definitely is a hindrance because um, it allows a tool that is great as typology to now become almost a weapon. Um, not even almost a weapon, like just pretty much literally a weapon. Like if you go on like Reddit and some Facebook groups and even sometimes in the Twitter community where in my opinion, I do think that, you know, Twitter people, like they, they know more um, than the average like Facebook group or even like Reddit group sometimes. But even then you can still kind of like see where there's like some kind of like bias or, you know, like demonizing and weaponizing of certain types. Um, and this is not just some NF flowery stuff when we say that every type is equally great. Um, we really do mean that. I don't think that there's a problem at all with having a preference of which type that you have. Like for example, um, just straight off the bat, you know, like my top three favorite types are ISFP, INFJ, and INTJ. Like that's just, <laughs> that's just, it is what it is. Um, but um, that's not to say that, you know, and I, I do also have like, you know, my least favorite types, but 
That's not to say that if I were to meet somebody um, and immediately like I heard, like somebody told me in advance, like, oh, there are this type that all of a sudden I'm going to um, get some kind of like frustration towards them, like roll my eyes or even like get like excited about it because I've met ISFPs and INFJs and INTJs that quite honestly are just not that great. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, some of them actually even suck um, to be totally honest, like they were not healthy. Um, and then I've also met um, certain types um, that I'm not really usually as fond of that are phenomenal people or phenomenal individuals. Um, and if I were to judge them only based off of their type, then I would have run into a very strong wall. And so I think that it's really important for, you know, especially like when it comes to like this whole INFJ overhype. And the reason why, again, we harp on the INFJ is because um, I'd like to think that it's been getting better over the past couple of years. Um, but I do know that it's it's still something that's big, you know, this whole notion that uh, the INFJ is this mystical wizard that, you know, is just able to foretell the future in this way. And of course, it's like a lot of truth to that. But then because of their rarity and all of that, which by the way, I just, my TI just always has to like correct. The INFJ is not the rarest type anymore as of recent discovery, but even then, who cares? <laughs> like, who cares if they're the rarest or if they're not the rarest? The whole point of this, you know, episode even is to say that, you know, like, love people for who they are, like the individual for who they are. Um, so there, you can obviously like, you know, like I've noticed a pattern with myself that, okay, even before I knew about type, I was very drawn to ISFPs. Like there were just certain ISFPs that in my life, like my best friend, Nick, from the second grade, he was he's an ISFP. In second grade, I didn't know that he was an ISFP. You know, my best friend David, um, he's an INFJ. We knew each other ever since we were two years old. I didn't know that he was an INFJ back then. And I've met like a lot more ISFP. I'm married to an ISFP. I've I met a lot more INFJs, such as Joyce. Um, but it's not like this thing where it's like, oh, that person's an INFJ. I have to become best friends with them now. Then they're they're gonna tell me all the secrets to life. And oh, that person is a X type. And so that means they're really gonna suck and we're gonna butt heads a lot. And uh, I shouldn't even, I should just avoid them, you know? Like that kind of thing, almost like what we were talking about last week, when it comes to trusting your intuition, you're kind of setting yourself up for a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's not something that you want to be, uh, a position that you wanna be placing yourself in. Um, and so I wanna actually ask real quickly, Joyce, you're an INFJ. What would you say are some of the things, like, well, I guess number one, have you ever felt like other people were honestly like, you know, like over idealizing you um, and trying like have like, um, meet this standard of the online description of an INFJ and you kind of like felt like nervous on like, oh shoot, like they have this impression of me, this preconceived impression of me that I now have to meet and I'm probably gonna let them down. Um, and if so, how did you handle that? What what kind of things did you um, find that, okay, yeah, I, I do relate to these parts of the INFJ, but honestly, these parts, that we see online, I'm not always that. Um, does that make sense? Did I ask the question like a little bit clearly? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I totally think that when people hear about an INFJ, like you instantly have some sort of credibility in the type space. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like someone says they're an INFJ in the type space and then people tend to listen harder because when you think of an INFJ, you associate them with wisdom and mm -hmm. insight. And so you instantly, tend to listen a little harder when you figure out someone is of this type, which is, I guess, unfair in some instances because all types have their different types of wisdom too. Mm -hmm. And one out of a hundred people are like sociopaths. You don't know if that INFJ <laughs> you met is gonna be one of those sociopaths, you know, <laughs> statistically. So you don't know if they're gonna be that great of a person. <laughs> and so people tend to idealize the INFJ 
and you get the label of empath really easily too oh, yeah. you know because there's that stereotype that infjs absorb the emotions of other people which mm. they do but all all nf types absorb the emotions of other people too yeah. and so only the infj gets credit for that because infjs get the credit for all strengths they're like yeah yeah everyone cool gets typed as infj when they're not like martin luther king jr oh, yeah. he was typed as infj by some people too but he's he's an enfj um mm. and it's just because you're like wow he's so cool he must be an infj now so sometimes people type the people they like as the types that they like Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you're going to like people of that type because everyone you find cool, you just instantly assume they're of that type that you already like. And so I see that happening where people will just type people according to their chemistry with them. So mm -hmm. it's like, oh, we have that chemistry I normally have with INFJs. Therefore, mm -hmm. you must be an INFJ. And I'm yeah. like, yeah. what if they're not? What if you <laughs> you just get along really well with this person and you're <laughs> have this bias of typing everyone you like as this specific type? That's something I see happening. Mm -hmm. So Denzel mentioned earlier about how INFJ isn't the rarest type anymore. And that's true according to official MBTI statistics. So mm -hmm. right now, statistically, the most rare type is the ENTJ personality. Mm -hmm. So now if you want to be rare and you want to be a snowflake, type yourself as ENTJ. Right. <laughs> 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 or or go find yourself an ENTJ to overhype and let's see how they deal with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they have FI, maybe they'll enjoy it more being that special snowflake of a type. <laughs> I'm kidding. I that no, was a joke. <laughs> but but no, I really do I feel exactly like what you're saying. Um, because I've seen that a lot. It's like, what? No, you you can't be this type because I actually get along with you kind of thing. And it, like, it's like, well, that's, that's not how typology always works. You know, um, there, there are types that, you know, again, any two healthy people, individuals, no matter what their types are, whether it be romantically or platonically, they can work out, you know, um, there's just some that, you know, are s smoother, you know, in my opinion. So, for example, I do personally believe that there's a pattern that ENFJ, INFJ dynamics are a lot smoother than maybe like an INFJ, ISTJ, or INFJ, ESTJ, ENFJ, even ENFP kind of like dynamic. Um, because um, from what I've seen, like not only are the INFJ and the ENFJ, they're both sharing the same exact cognitive functions, um, just, you know, the top two reverse, the last two reverse. But also, FE is a function that is constantly looking at the relationships between people. And not only that, but how can they better those relationships between people? And then when you have a function with like introvert intuition also in the mix, then it's also looking at the long term dynamic of that relation, the longevity of that relationship. And so not only are you like looking at how to fix it and how to better it, but you're looking at what's the meaning of this dynamic and how can we make it last as long as we possibly can? Or is this even going to last? Um, and therefore should I invest my energy and time into it? So when you have two people who are both doing this, that means that you have two people who are usually like focused on just constantly bettering their dynamic with each other effortlessly. You know, it's like almost like unconscious, you know, like they don't usually have a problem with communicating with each other because they both have the same objective. So of course it's gonna be fluid, of course it's gonna be like smoother. And then also with, you know, the NI and hopping into each other's perspective, it's like almost like a telepathic kind of uh, a relationship that the ENFJ and the INFJ are having. Um, so yeah, there's high compat compatibility there. Um, and I can see how even someone such as myself, it's like, oh, well then of course, duh, you're an INFJ. That's why it seems like we just seem to smoothly and effortlessly get along. But if I find out that somebody's an INFJ beforehand, I'm not going to automatically assume that. Um, and trust me, I know a couple of INFJs, maybe like two to three, that yeah, that's just that's just not the case. Um, like we get along, sure, but we do not have this like magical dynamic. Um, and one of them, I even 
originally from like first impression, I thought that she was an ISTJ um, until that me and her talked a little bit more. She told me that she was an INFJ and I was like, really? Um, and I tried to consider it and then, you know, taught her about functions over some time and, you know, and it's like, oh, wow, interesting. You know, she really is. She's an Enneagram one, um, a social one, I believe. Uh, either self-preservation social or social self-preservation. Um, yeah, but either way, um, she, her and I definitely, like we, we get along, but I know that there's like a little bit of like friction there. Um, and these are things that, you know, I could see how maybe like a younger version of myself would start to doubt is this person really an INFJ? Because usually with INFJs, I have this kind of dynamic and this, this, that, and obviously they do this differently. But that again, is just not always the case. And that's why it's better or it's best to try to know an individual for who they are as an individual um, and not just from their type. Type, in my opinion, is supposed to be what helps you further understand that individual. Yeah, I see type as a good icebreaker. Mm -hmm. So it's good for coming up with conversational topics you can talk with someone about. Now, you have the topic of someone's mind structure as a potential springboard for conversation. Mm -hmm. So it allows you to have deeper conversation. So mm -hmm. if you ask someone, how do you experience an I or how do you experience FE? You get yeah. a, a deeper understanding of their personal experience with their functions. Exactly. It's a way of getting people to talk about themselves without talking about themselves. It mm -hmm. makes them more comfortable because they can kind of call things certain terms instead of just solely referring to themselves, which ultimately gets people to share more about themselves and it creates a more intimate atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. like the good NFIM, I see everything as a further catalyst of intimacy to further your connection yeah. with that person. Exactly. And so exactly. type is best used as a way to, to supplement or even enhance the intimacy you already have with someone. It's not meant to barricade that intimacy. If it is preventing you from getting closer to someone, if it is causing you to judge someone, then that is typing used in a way that's not productive. Right. And ultimately type is a tool mm -hmm. and you can use tools productively or you can use tools incredibly unproductively. Yeah, harmful, so, if anything. Yeah, hopefully, yeah, yeah. So you can use type as like um, a hammer to build a, a big mansion with, or you could use it as a hammer to build a box with, so you can fit everyone into that box. <laughs> so <laughs> that went a completely different direction than I thought it was gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a what a what a great image. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you can use type to make more space for people and mm. their individuality and their differences, or you can use type to make less space for people and who they truly are. So it's up to you what you use this tool for. Yeah, okay. I wanna go down this rabbit trail right now before I revisit what I was gonna say. How do you think that would look like building a mansion? We know how to build a box. A lot of people who come into the typology community know how to build a box, but how do you think building a mansion through type would look like? You honor their rooms. So mm -hmm. you, instead of decorating their room for them, you ask them, where would you like your bed to be? How would you want your kitchen to look like? Mm -hmm. What is that most ideal basement for you? Mm -hmm. So it's allowing a room for customization and personalization, asking yeah. people what they would want to fill their house with, what it, what it is actually truly filled with. So type is good for giving you that exoskeleton and you let the person themselves fill in the little details in there. So you can give them the general framework. You use NI, FE, TI, SE if they're an INFJ. And then you ask them, how would you fill those rooms? Mm. How do those rooms look like to you? So you, you allow people to tell their own story instead of inferring and trying to stick in a narrative that doesn't fit them. Like, you know, type is used right when you're fitting a square peg into a square hole. You know, type is being used wrong when you're trying to fit 
a square peg into a circle hole mm -hmm. then and, and it's not fitting and mm -hmm. you're trying to like shave parts of people off just to get them to fit into your conceptualization of what it is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as soon as type is used to edit out the beautiful things about people it's used wrong mm -hmm. and when type is used to get people to express those beautiful things about themselves to get them to use more of the beautiful parts of themselves that is when type is used correctly mm -hmm. yeah ultimately does it amplify the beauty of that person or does it suppress that beauty of the person yeah. that is what determines if type is being used for a good purpose yeah <laughs> i love how you um said all of that because i see you practice that a lot on your um own channel on your individual channel um you literally host people of all different types or people of the same type and we know that you already have all the knowledge um the theoretical knowledge at least but then i love how you actually engage your fe and your se to ask them directly like hey so this is what i've read about infps or this is what i've heard about infps how do you guys relate to this and you let them decorate the room you don't tell them like okay well infps are supposed to do this and so therefore i'm putting this here infps are supposed to have this and their room or they're supposed to have their chandelier, have a chandelier um, and this, 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 that. But instead it's more like, hey, okay, so I, um, I've read this or I've heard this or even I've noticed this pattern with people who I believe to be INFP. I have four INFP over here. Um, how do each of you experience this? Um, and that's giving them the opportunity. Some of them might confirm like, yeah, no, that's right. And then maybe like one or two of them might be like, mm, I don't really feel that way. Um, and this is why. And then it gives you some more nuance um, for you to be able to understand like, okay. And that's the biggest thing. Once you start to see the nuance of each type, these 16 personalities don't just remain 16 anymore. Cause now you're seeing like, just so much nuance, like, okay, this might be a box of ESTP, but this is a pretty big box. Like there's the ESTP that's out on the corner, like, you know, just smoking and having a fight club and, you know, philosophizing about all this other crazy stuff, like Tyler Durden type of ESTP. And then there's one that's like, probably like a really, you know, keen detective and he's just like watching people's body language and all of that. Like there's different ways that each personality type like may come across or may come about. Um, there's some ESTPs that are jerks. And then there's some ESTPs that are actually some of the kindest people that you'd probably meet and are really good leaders. Um, and when you see this kind of like nuance between people of different types, it becomes hard to really look at a type and be like, I don't like them. Um, or or like, okay, like because this person is that type, like I'm automatically going to just love them, you know? Like you really have to wait and um, get to know that person again on an individual level. And that's again, like one of the biggest things that like I realized, like the way that I was even able to determine like, oh, these are the types that are probably like my favorite is simply because I, I did look back over my life um, from a quote unquote non-biased standpoint. And I realized like, okay, these are the types that I've been drawn to again, even before I knew what type they were. Before I knew what type Jamila was, I didn't know about type when I first met her, but I was drawn to her. Uh, my friend, Nick, I didn't know what type he was, but I was drawn to him. Me and my friend, David, I didn't know what type he was, but I was drawn to him. You know, These are the people that, you know, when I count up, how frequently I run into these certain types of people. It just so happens, oh, this is the, the wow, these are a lot of ISFPs on the list. They might be a favorite of mine. Oh, wow, there's a lot of like INFJs here on the list. They might be a favorite of mine, you know? Um, and when I look at, you know, the types that I tend to like butt heads with, it's like, okay, wow, this is interesting. Um, a lot of the people that I've butt heads with in the past, again, even before I knew type, happen to be this type interesting but i don't want to punish people who are of this type that
that I'm going to meet in the future, like, oh, you're the same type as this list of people that I butted that I butt heads with in the past. So therefore, I'm going to butt heads with you. Because if anything, that might cause me to become to to butt heads with that person. Instead, I should just hold back whatever you know my ideas of type are for that person and just engage that person as an individual or use it as a tool and be like, okay, I know this person thinks this way. So therefore, let me use this to my advantage, to our advantage, not just mine, but ours, and actually have a better interface, a better communication with them. Um, I've butt heads with people of this type in the past because, shoot, I was speaking very NI and they prefer SI. And it's like, oh, this is where we were like hitting. And then on top of that, I'm using FE and TI and they're using TE and FI. And so it's like, okay, you know what? Actually, let me try to not use as much NI. Let me try to speak more in an SE kind of way. Like, you know, maybe that'll like help with the SI in some way. Like it'll be easier for them than even the NI would be. Um, or let me try my best to get into an SI kind of like headspace to be able to interface with them or just not take certain things as personally in the way that they say it. Um, and from understanding how like this is just how they think and that's just how it is and holding them like as an individual in that sense, um, it's allowing me to have a better interaction with them altogether. And then in the same sense, you don't want to, you, you don't want to do the, the opposite either where it's like, oh, wow, I love people of this type. So therefore, oh, um, like, I, I, oh, I heard that the new girl is an INFJ. So just because I heard that, I don't even know how she looks like. I don't know anything about her, but I just know I have to be friends with her when I get to work tomorrow. What? <laughs> like, and it's like, you're laughing, but it's like, I know, I know that people think this way. I, I will never forget. And I said this in my ENFJ problem paradoxes and patches video. Um, there was a, this ENFP girl who she saw that I was getting into typology. Like we both worked at um, the library together and she saw I was like researching stuff about type and everything. Um, and she was like, she was like, um, oh, you're into Myers Briggs? Like, that's cool. Like, I'm an ENFP. What type are you? And then I was like, oh, I'm an ENFJ. She's like, oh, okay. I heard that there's an INFJ here somewhere. I swear that's exactly how she said it. And I was like, now I'm not saying that every ENFP <laughs> thinks like that, but this girl just so happened to be an ENFP. And that's how she she acted like. And I don't know if it's because she probably like read online that INFJs are the best match for ENFPs or something, or just simply because of the INFJ overhype. But I I now feel bad for an INFJ that she probably had met um, at that time because now she probably has this very high expectation of that INFJ, and it's very easy to disappoint. <laughs> um, and we know how NFPs can be sometimes, where it's like if you disappoint their ideal of you, then it's kind of hard to recover from that. Um, so my whole point with that whole spiel is that let's be careful with that. It's it's cool to like read these theories online and like see like okay, this is how that type is in real life. I mean, this is how that type is like you know online description and this is that, but let's be careful with like projecting our idea of how that type is onto a person before you even get to know them um, as who they are. Absolutely. I find with NFPs, a lot of them, when they over-idealize a person, like they have like a really, 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 really positive view of that person. Because mm -hmm. extroverted intuition is an optimistic function. So when it's ideating, it's going to project all these like positive assumptions about you. And then I notice NFPs will go into a relationship with like an extreme ideal or fantasy about that person. They're like, wow, this person's so amazing in this, 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 this way. And then, or even a new apartment that they move into too, they'll name off all the amazing things about their apartment. Mm -hmm. like, I love it for this, 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 this reason. And then over time, the reality sinks in and they're mm -hmm. like, you know what? I don't like this. I, I, I really, I'm, I'm not liking this. This is, there's something wrong with this place. With NFPs, I'll be like, wow, that really took a 180. Like you're really <laughs> enjoying it at the beginning. And then later you're really not enjoying it. 
I noticed yeah. that pattern in general with NFPs. When I state patterns, I'm saying that they're they're patterns, not rules. So mm -hmm. if that doesn't apply to you, then it doesn't apply to you. Yeah. But exactly. I noticed that to be a trend for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. NFTs admit to that too. So there's that as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And so on the points that you mentioned, Denzel, you you know if type is being used in a healthy way too through a few signs. So if you feel like you have to censor yourself to fit in, that is a sign that type's not being used productively. Mm. So if you feel like you have to engage in self-censorship mm. because people will doubt your type if you act mm. a little bit different than what your type is. I noticed in the community, sometimes people feel the pressure to lie or to kind of misrepresent their experience to fit in. So they'll kind of want to peacock certain parts of themselves or hide certain parts of the parts of themselves to fit more into the community. So they're more accepted. So wow, you're acting like a true INFJ. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, you know, you're accepted into the crowd. Yeah. And always in groups or like in large groups of people, you're going to run into this conflict where you're going to feel pressure to conform mm -hmm. and but that's always a sign that you're in an unhealthy situation because if you ever feel the pressure to lie about yourself, that's always, that's already a clue that you're not accepted for who you are. Right. And what, what's most important is that you're accepted for who you are. Right. Mm -hmm. Type should only be a bonus pack onto that, like an extension pack, something that adds to the experience of being accepted for who you are. But if fundamentally the people around you will only accept you if you meet a certain amount of criteria, that's intrinsically wrong. And yes. that'll get you to mix up your motives. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it'll cause you to do things for the wrong reasons yeah. and it'll cause you fatigue in the long run too, because mm -hmm. you're going to have increasing amounts of cognitive dissonance over time. You're like, mm -hmm. wow, I really have to hide parts of myself in the beginning, in the short term, it might be easy to do that, but compounded over time, you're going to eventually either get resentful that people aren't really knowing the true you or like listening to your actual opinions or who you actually are, or you're going to get disenfranchised with the community because over a long period of time, it's not going to be as rewarding to fake it. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a big thing, actually. Like it's really important also to not try to fit into your type, which is again, like now you're, you're stuffing yourself into that box. Um, but again, that, and that's a tricky thing to say because then it's like, well, if I'm not supposed to be fitting into my type, what am I supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to be trying to go against it? I wouldn't say actively try to go against it either. I would say just keep being you. And that's the thing about being boxed. You know, before I knew I was an ENFJ, I was an ENFJ. <laughs> Even if right now I did not know that I was an ENFJ, I'm pretty sure that Martin Luther King Jr. did not know that he was an ENFJ, but he's still in, he was still an ENFJ through and through his life. You know, um, Oprah literally does not know that she's an ENFJ. She actually believes that she's an introvert for God knows why. But um, <laughs> and it's like, no, like regardless of whatever type that you are, you're still you. And that that kind of security really it brings you a different type of peace. Because now when people start telling you what type that you are, um, and again, caveats here, because sometimes, first of all, I, I don't really agree with people saying like, oh, you, you're mistyped. I don't, I don't agree with that kind of like poking kind of things. Um, but I do think that everyone should be open to discussion. Like if I, for example, was like suspicious of Joyce being an INFJ, um, I would not approach her and be like, you're, you're mistyped, you're actually this or whatever. But instead I would say, okay, I'd just be honest. I'd be like, hey, I'm not trying to offend you or anything. And if you're offended, in my opinion, I think that's because you're, you're wrapping too much of your identity in your type and not really like, you know, holding this at a distance. Um, so if I went to Joyce and like, you know, actually, I. I've been thinking and um, we can hash this out, you know, but in my mind, I'm starting to wonder, like, maybe you're probably an ENTP. I don't know. I just feel like, you know, like I've been seeing extrovert intuition with this and 
boom, boom, boom. Um, but let's talk about that if you want. Um, Joyce also has the freedom to be like, no, I like I don't really want to talk about it. That's totally her call, you know. Um, but she also has the freedom to be like, oh, okay, interesting. Well, thanks for coming to me, like respectfully and everything. And you know, not that she has to prove herself to me, but she's gonna try to help like ease my mind. Like, okay, well, I see why you th you could see extrovert intuition over here, but actually, like, what's going on is boom, 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 and. It's oh, okay, and then now there's like a discussion that helps you, again, further expand your view of INFJ and how they might look like in ENTP. Um, but if you are, um, if you're like trying to fit the INFJ mold so much, like, oh, I heard that INFJs own crystal balls, so I'm going outside to go and buy one. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if that's something like, is that something that you would have done or is this something that you're just doing because your type said that, you know? Um, oh, I heard that ENFJs um, are really into astrology and reading signs and all of this. So therefore I'm going to now go and do that. It's like, if you have a genuine interest in it, for sure, you know, but if you're only doing this, like match that ENFJ mold. Um, oh, I heard that ESTPs, are really good at, um, I don't know, doing backflips. So I'm gonna go learn how to do a backflip or I'm gonna go drag race or something. Like, well, you don't have to do that to prove that you're an ESTP. Regardless of whether or not you do that, you're still an ESTP. Now, if you just have a genuine interest, that's totally different. But if you're trying to box yourself into your own type to prove to yourself and to other people that you are this type. Oh yeah, I heard that ENTPs are jerks. I literally heard a girl say this before. Like, she was like, she's like, yeah, you know, like I don't like ENTPs don't care about people. I don't care about people. It's like, okay, well, number one, that's wrong. Every type should care about people regardless of whether you're a thinker or a feeler. Um, if you're a healthy person, you care about other people. Like that's point blank period. Um, but also if you're only like, if you're using your type to justify bad behavior, not, not a good thing. That's, that's also misusing the tool. All in all to say is that try to find that balance of not necessarily going against the type that you are like, oh, you know, um, I used to like basketball, but now that I, I learned that ISTPs love basketball, then now I don't want to like basketball anymore. It's like, again, you're going against who you are already. And regardless, you're still an ISTP. <laughs> like that's not going to change that. And in the same sense, oh, you know, I, 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 I don't like basketball, but I heard the ISTPs like basketball. So therefore I'm going to go and play basketball. That's not going to make you more of an ISTP. You are who you are. And then at the end of the day, once you figure out and once you know who you are, even when other people are telling you that you are mistyped, at the end of the day, you can know that you are still you. If people, I've had people like tell me that I'm an INFP or that I'm an ISFP or like stuff like that or ESFJ, whatever. And I'm just like, okay, cool, like whatever. Because at the end of the day, I'm still me. Even if I have this new label ESFJ, the way that I speak, the way that I think, the way that I carry myself, everything that has to do with me is still, is not gonna change. Maybe your perception of how it's all like, you know, where, where it's all coming from will change. And unfortunately, you know, now you're projecting wrong things onto me, but that's also not really my problem. I'm um, at the end of the day, I'm still me. And at the end of the day, you are still you. Um, so get to know people for who they are so that that way, you don't project type onto them because at the end of the day, type is something that's supposed to help us understand the individual. Um, and we, we mold type better with the individual, not like, oh, Joyce asking the panel of INTPs um, this question and they all say something. And then she's like, well, you guys have to now start doing this because this is what I read on Reddit. So if you guys are really INTP, you have to do this. It's no, it's like, okay, then that means that that thing I read on Reddit is wrong. 
because I'm pretty positive these people are INTPs and they don't relate. So that means we have to edit what was on Reddit. We, we, we're not going to try to, we're not going to try to get the INTPs to now mold into whatever was there, you know? Um, yeah. I keep on saying a lot, but I'm try, I'm trying to keep my mind like organized as I'm speaking everything. But <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. types are there to serve you. You are not there to serve type. Mm -hmm. So if the description doesn't fit you and you're correctly typed, then it requires the description to make room for your complexity as a person mm -hmm. rather than you trying to fit into a two dimensional description. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Because there's a lot of psychological harm that could manifest from that. Because every time you try to fit yourself into something that's not you, you're sending yourself a message that you you are not good enough as you are. Mm -hmm. And and it's really important for your psychological and mental well-being that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are enough as you are. Because yeah. you are. Mm -hmm. You, the listener, you are enough as you are. Yeah. And th there's that urge to sometimes fit into a group and to compromise yourself because intrinsically there's a lack of self-esteem or lack of self-worth. Mm -hmm. And so we think to be enough, we have to fit into a certain type of category well enough. Yeah. And that's simply not true. So if you feel an urge to fit yourself into a box, it's also a sign that you might not believe you are enough as you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a signal to look more inward and to look at what might be lacking within you if you feel the urge to be someone who you're not. Mm -hmm. That it, it pro you probably have difficulty seeing value in yourself as you are. And yeah. so that is a wonderful thing to bring up <laughs> with an NF friend that you have who loves talking about psychological depth with people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, as an INFJ, I love to talk to people about those type of things. And I bet Denzel, you love to talk about those things too, as an ENFJ with people, like yeah, for sure. talking about them as a person and dissecting their mind and mm -hmm. their psychology and their wiring of their mind is the most fulfilling thing for NFs ever. For sure. I feel like when NFs get together, they're just meeting everyone's love languages or, or meeting each other's love languages so well that I, like, I've never felt so loved in my life in a way that I've, I've felt loved by my NF or feeler friends. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but I don't, I don't, I, I mean, I think you can totally do it too. I mm -hmm. find that feelers have a, a proclivity mm -hmm. to engage in warm fuzzies. So when I'm like with my ENFJ friends or with my INFP friends, um, we get really emotional with each other. We kind of exchange those vibes, those chemicals, and we mm -hmm. kind of try to meet all the love languages. You know, like some people, they focus on one or two of the love languages. I feel like NFs want to go above and beyond that bar. They go like, how can I meet all five of your love languages as best as possible? And yeah. when you have like two, two or more NFs who are friends, you mm -hmm. get them trying to meet all your love languages at the same time. And you feel kind of love bombed. <laughs> and that's how I feel like when I, when I meet with, fellow NFs. So I can, I can see that, that certain people can have certain types that they prefer because of their experiences with those types. And also some people just have certain preferences too. Like for instance, if you're attracted to certain people with blue eyes, that doesn't make you against other eye colors. It just right. means that you have a preference for a certain type of eye color and that's fine. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's fine to have a preference. Yeah. But I guess, I, mm -hmm it's easy to label people. And so our, our primal mind is kind of wired to pick the easiest, most convenient route mentally. And the, so the path of least resistance is the easiest path. Mm -hmm. And so we have a pro proclivity as human beings to label and then rank people. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, what is your label and how do I rank you due to that label? It can be potentially toxic in the tech community when you're trying to label people because all types are amazing, you know? the purpose of type is to celebrate diversity. So mm -hmm. it's to go like, wow, you think differently and you think differently. And that's all great. Now that we understand where it's coming from, we can respect it more. Right. And we can see it as something very positive and we can celebrate it and we can figure out ways to use your strengths more so that you're more happy in your life because your type is often connected to your flow state. So once mm -hmm. you figure out your type, 
you know, the general areas where you feel a sense of flow and it's where our flow state is that we find our happiness. Mm -hmm. And so when we figure out different people and what brings them into their flow state, we can honor that better and we can have more happy people who are living more in their purpose and their passion. So that's what type is at its best. We help figure out what makes people happy and what's effortless to them. Like what's fun, light, easy, it gives them a sense of purpose and contribution. And now how do we add more of that into their life? Okay. That's type being used constructively. It's used destructive, destructively when we use it to create prejudice and ranking of the worthiness of people based off their type. Yeah, which is a natural instinct because we want to be safe and we want to be protected. So one of the ways we can protect ourselves is to figure out all the worst types and then protect ourselves from those worst types. Mm -hmm. But I would say to be aware of that natural brain proclivity to spot threat and then to label threat and then to to degrade threat and to not apply that to type because all types have wonderful things about them and i understand where the urge to label people comes from and sometimes i can be guilty of it too just because humans do it with everything so mm -hmm. i'm not immune to it no one's immune to it but if we keep ourselves in check if we regulate ourselves as a community if we just regulate all, all of our perceptions and make sure that we're not discriminating when we shouldn't be, then we'll, we'll be like one big happy type family and we don't have to have fire and hate and a lack of bond between us. Something ENFJs and INFJs are very aware of is unnecessary conflict mm -hmm. and unnecessary <laughs> disharmony, right? Yeah, We notice this because we want people to get along and we want people to be in each other's best interests and that we're all working in a way where our relationships add to our lives rather than detriment. And so this philosophy we're kind of preaching is showing the NFJ mentality that if we approach type with less prejudice, we will have less unnecessary conflict and thus we'll have happier relationships where we all respect each other, love each other, meet each other's needs, make everyone feel comfortable and welcomed in this community, feel like they're a part of it rather than discluded or left out or or kind of mistreated when they don't have to be that way, when yeah. that doesn't have to be the case. Mm -hmm. I yeah. was so beautiful, <laughs> Joyce. Yeah, I, I totally resonate with like, yeah, I, I just, everything that you said, perfect. Um, especially what you said about like the blue eyes, um, like oh, if you if you prefer someone with blue eyes, like, it's not a problem. The problem becomes, I just, the whole point of all of this is the like, problem becomes like if you are if you um, are shaming people who don't have blue eyes and slash or because you see somebody with blue eyes, then you automatically expect that blue eyed person to be a great person. It's like no, they just happen to have blue eyes. Same thing, no. They just happen to be an INFJ. And although their cognition is this way, again, there are really, there's some really bad INFJs out there, you know, and there's some really good ESTJs out there, you know, and so yeah, you really have to get to know the person at, at that core level. And then um, the last thing that I'm just gonna say um, is that I, I remember um, an INFJ coming to me um, just a few weeks ago um, and she, she told me how um, she said that she has a friend who looks at her and is like, hey, um, pretty much her friend feels like she uses typology too much to like psychoanalyze and all of that and almost like look at her from like a detached kind of view. Um, and the INFJ was like saddened about it by it because she was like, wow, like I I'm sorry that I make this friend like feel that way. Like that's not really like how it is. And I told her that I related in the sense that I have an ESFP, um, you know, brother-in-law um, who he told me once upon a time, like, you know, because even though like everybody sees me here on YouTube and they see the like, okay, like I'm talkative and, you know, stuff like that. But like, honestly, like in real life, I'm not going to say that like, oh, I'm I'm not this kind of like INTJ, ISTP5 type of person. I'm not going to press that. But I'm also not this like talkative and just 
energetic kind of thing. Like, so there was like a few dinners where I was with this ESFP brother-in-law and throughout the whole dinner, you know, I'm just like chilling and I'm just like this, you know, and I'm just, and I didn't even have like a hmm type of face. You know, I'm just kind of like, I'm just chilling, you know? And sure, I, I'm always observing, but it wasn't, I guess like, this was one of those moments where like he, he just looked at me and he was just like, I just always feel like you're like psychoanalyzing and personality psychologizing me and this is, this is that. And we had to have, I had to have a talk with him. Like, no, no, I'm not doing that. Um, sure. Because I study a lot of this stuff. Like I might notice a lot of things. And then in my head, I'm like, Oh wow, that was a fire. Oh, this was that. But I'm not just sitting there like, Hmm. Oh, this is interesting. Ah, he needs to work on that. And like, that's, that's not really the case. If anything, the way that I use type is the way that, you know, Joyce was just explaining. And that is I use type to better understand the individual. Um, I, I see it as like a, a map. It's almost like when people, like when people are going out on a date and it's like a hundred questions to ask your, that person on a date kind of thing. It's like, okay, these are icebreakers that, you know, like, so if I'm like, you know, talking to Joyce and I know that she's an INFJ, again, I'm not going to start off with the notion like, oh, then she must be a great person, but it's going to be something to me. It's like, oh, she uses introverted intuition as a dominant function. Boom. She uses extroverted feeling as an auxiliary function. Boom. All right. I don't know how exactly she uses it, but this is a great opportunity for me to ask her like, hey, Joyce, um, how do you relate to introverted intuition? Um, oh, Joyce, like, you know, I heard about this, um, like from INFJs usually or like boom, boom. How is that for you? And it's an opportunity. That's where it becomes personal because now the thing that separates Joyce from all other INFJs is how she uses her functions. The thing that separates you as an individual, any like you as in the listener or viewer, um, is how you use your functions. Nobody uses FE in the exact same way that I did. Even Oprah and um, Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela, or whatever, they don't. They didn't use FE in the exact same way. Hitler and Jesus definitely did not use FE in the exact same way. You know, so it's like get to know the person for who they are, um, and if you're like you know trying to get to know them through type, understand how they use their um, functions through type. When me and Joyce, we both do profiling sessions. And it's so euphoric for me. Like I've posted a few of my profile sessions on my um, individual channel and you can see me like excited, like excitably like getting to know the person. And like, I'm not just trying to like figure out like, okay, what's your type? Boom, stamp that on you. But I'm like, wow. So I know a lot of ENFPs, but the way that you use FI right here, like that's incredible. Like, you know, I... That's so cool. Like, so wait, you do this? That is so dope. Boom. And it, it makes me fascinated with the person even more, like as an individual. Um, and again, I can know several other ENFPs. I can coach several other ENFPs, but there's no ENFP that's like that one, you know? Um, and that's that's where this all comes down to. So if you're using type in a constructive way. Um, or if you feel like somebody's like psychoanalyzing you of type all the time, they could be just actually trying to use it as a better way to get to know you. Um, and again, you can identify this by if they're like trying to fit you neatly into that box, um, or if they are actually trying to like figure out like, how do you relate? And last comment, fitting neatly into that box is different from like personal development. So like me teaching an INFJ, how to better use FE or an INFJ teaching me how to better use an I is not them boxing me into my type, in my opinion, at least. It's helping me become a better version of who I already am because I already use an I. I already use FE. Now, if they're trying to get me to use FI, like if my wife, ISFP, is trying to get me to use FI, now she's trying to like change me from who I am, you know? And I think that that's like a little bit different. It's not that we never use FI. We have access to all eight functions, but if she's trying to get me to use it as like one of my primary ones consistently and like making me not want to use FE and stuff like that, that's a problem. So you, these are a lot of things that you have to like watch out for. Um, yeah, this is a heavy, this is a heavy episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well said, Denzel.
type is a really good general accurate framework for people and frameworks are good as generalities so mm -hmm. you buy a map of a place it won't tell you where all of the little details are in that map but it'll give you a general overview and so type is great at giving you a general overview of how a person is like mm -hmm. but it's up to that person to tell you their unique fingerprint of that type so just like every part of our body is unique to us mm -hmm. so so basically your fingerprint is unique to you but did you know also your voices? That's why, you know, banks right now, they're asking for your voice print and if they can recognize you off your, your voice print because your voice is so unique that they can use voice recognition to tell that it's you. And the same thing is with the irises of your eyes and every single part of you down to your personality. And so my personality as an INFJ is radically different than another INFJ and how they experience being an INFJ. Now, mm -hmm. what will be common is like the general mm -hmm. overview of our personality and the framework will be accurate, but mm -hmm. the little things that make us us, they're just as unique as the fingerprint we have to identify us as a unique human being. So it's almost like it's great to have these 16 types, but we also have to acknowledge that we're more than just our type too. Type is an extremely real thing. Like mm -hmm. I. I'm 100% sold that type is a reality and yeah. I can see it in people. I can type people really easily. Yeah, when and you it's profile people, you cannot deny that. They, do, they don't even know about type and they're telling you what type they are. It's crazy. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Type is a genuine thing. Like it is as real as the oxygen you breathe, in my opinion, because I can literally profile people who don't know anything about type and they, they do have a, a type that they fit into. Mm -hmm. So, we're not so unique that we ha we are all uncategorizable at all, but we're also unique enough that there's an infinite amount of space within a category. So there's not just one way an ESTP expresses themselves. There's an infinite amount of ways an ESTP can be, but their starting platform, that jumping spot, that springboard, that launching pad, the starting place is, is very ESTP. So, you know, they're gonna use all those functions, but how that starting point manifest beyond that starting point is up to that individual mm -hmm. and so we both play into an archetype in this case it's the Jungian archetypes and it's a real thing so we all have a part of ourselves that fits into an archetype and we all have a part of ourselves that is just unique to us and it's to acknowledge and accept both parts of these and to really have these parts play into each other in healthy ways and to not to not negate the unique part of us ourselves to just identify with our archetype or not just negate our archetype because we only think we're a unique human being, mm -hmm. but to have a healthy balance between these two parts of ourselves. Right. And that's where, you know, practicing type ethically comes in. You know, we practice type ethically when we're able to respect both the uniqueness and the archetypical qualities of a person. And we're able to ex see these both as realities instead of just seeing one of these things. Yes. And yeah, and that's when type is used in the best way possible, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this was an amazing conversation, Denzel. Thank you everyone for watching The Knife Show. And until next time, stay, stay sharp. sharp.